Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in today's video we're going to be using Kerbal Space Program to talk about a very secret mission by the United States Air Force that was actually originally developed by NASA. And here we're talking about this unusual space plane known as Boeing X-37 that is actually currently orbiting somewhere around our planet and nobody really knows why. Okay, some people know why, but definitely not us. Today we're going to explore this mission, launch it using Kerbal Space Program, and possibly investigate some of the ideas behind it. Welcome Welcome to What The Math. So if you haven't actually seen it in my Kerbal Space Program videos, I have close to 100 of them. You can definitely check out them um, in the playlist available on your screen right now. And a lot of these videos were either dealing with sciences and maths or exploring various historical missions. But today I wanted to investigate a mission that is actually very realistic and very modern. This mission was originally developed by NASA back in 1999 because of the um, Challenger uh, disaster. Basically, when Space Shuttle exploded and killed all of the astronauts on board, NASA started to develop um, an alternative mission that was uh, without any pilots, without any people, and was uh, basically autonomous. Now, let's uh, actually launch this mission first, and this is an Atlas rocket. Uh, we're going to launch it uh, from Kerbal Space Center, and it, we're going to try to take it into space on the first try, and let's see if it works. So this is an Atlas V rocket, Atlas V rocket, a very, very powerful rocket that NASA uses to launch smaller satellites. And we're going to try to do this without any um, guidance and without any instruments. And because I've played this game quite a lot, I might be able actually to actually pull it off, but maybe, just maybe, it will not work. You can already see that it's a little bit unstable. But so yeah, so this uh, particular rocket um, launches a very, very, very unusual and but very interesting and somewhat small uh, space plane that is actually hiding behind all of this, and you're going to see it in a second. And this space plane has been developed over the years as um, as a kind of a secret mission for NASA to test, or not for NASA, but for uh, the Defense Department and possibly NASA to test various technologies. And uh, some of these technologies are secretive, some of these technologies are military-based, but nobody still knows exactly what um, NASA and what Department of Defense have actually been testing in space. The first mission uh, took off quite a few years ago, actually, and specifically in 2010, uh, something like six years ago, uh, this was a mission known as OTV-1, and OTV stands for Orbital Test Vehicle. And it wasn't actually announced by anyone, it was kind of secretive, nobody really uh, knew what's happening, why it's uh, being launched. Or at least it wasn't publicly announced, because it was actually a secret space mission um, to test various secret technologies. And even today, we don't exactly know what it was actually testing. Um, but it was on top of Atlas V rocket, which you kind of see here. This is a, a recreation using normal parts, um, stock parts. And uh, um, Atlas V rocket is a very powerful rocket, so it was definitely launching something relatively heavy. Alright, so the first stage is over. We're going to release uh the first stage and there it goes and now we're going to launch the second stage and we're basically going to be boosting ourselves uh horizontally now i may actually need to correct my orbit using the map because i haven't really been paying attention to my um my lateral or horizontal speed but that's essentially what you see right here. That is actually X-37B. This is the space plane that NASA currently operates. I keep saying NASA, but it's not NASA. It's the Air Force. Air, Air Force currently operates under the pretense of various space missions. So we've overshot our orbit, uh, orbital path just a little bit because I wasn't using instruments. But for now, we're just going to aim at the maneuver node, which will actually circularize our orbit at the... Um, height of about 364 kilometers above Kerbin. So this is sort of uh, a higher Kerbin orbit, which is absolutely fine. Now, uh, we're going to wait for, uh, for a few minutes just to, to get to that location. But for now, let's actually just talk about the possibility of this mission being um, an actual military mission and not a space exploration mission. And so, originally, this was a NASA mission uh, until about 2004, when it was actually transferred to the Department of Defense um, and became a Defense Advanced Research Project Agency's um, tool that was used to test various space uh, technologies. Specifically, we're here, we're talking about various spy satellites 
and various uh, space technologies that, that would be used on spy satellites. So what they would usually do is place the um, either the satellite or the equipment from the satellite into the compartment that is right there. You can't really see it, but I'm going to turn... Uh, turn the ship so you can actually see it a little better. But right here, there's a tiny, tiny compartment. And um, this compartment was used to store various sort of tools and would then be used to essentially um, either put a satellite in orbit or possibly put a part of the satellite in orbit so that it can then be tested in space. Or at least that's the current speculation about what, uh, what this particular um, shuttle or, or space orbiter is for. Uh, this is sort of the understanding that we have of it right now. And we think that maybe this is actually what it's used for currently. Now, we don't exactly know because uh, Department of Defense doesn't usually announce uh, the truth about its missions and all of them are classified. But we think that maybe this is what it's actually for. So the second stage will finish uh, burning in a few seconds. And we're going to be in an almost circular orbit in a sort of a higher plane of orbit around Kerbin. So let's just finish our burning right here. And perfect. So this is a little bit more elliptical than I wanted it to be, but that's that's fine. It's not a big deal. We're going to separate ourselves from the last stage. And there you go. So this is X-37B, also known as OTV, um, in orbit around, um, around Kerbin, or basically around Earth in a sense. So... Inside of this uh, module, you'll see there's some solar panels. Usually the solar panels would actually come out on the outside and um, it, it can spend quite a long time in space. This particular orbiter uh, is known to actually overshoot its actual mission parameter. So even though it's only planned to be in space for about 220 days, it stayed uh, in space for up to 530 or even longer. Uh, the current mission has already been in space for over 500 days, and it's not really planning to come back anytime soon. In other words, this particular orbiter seems to uh, actually be intended for very, very, very uh, long-term missions. And so it's quite interesting what NASA has created and what Department of Defense has perfected. Uh, they basically created this kind of a, a space uh, weapon, is in a sense, that is able to spend a lot of time in space and possibly capture enemy satellites, possibly destroy enemy satellites, and possibly even spy on enemy um, space stations, like, for example, uh, the Chinese space station that has been actually orbiting our planet for a few years now. So let's actually orbit a few times around Kerbin just to simulate the reality of this particular mission. And so this is what it would normally be doing. It would actually be just kind of floating around space, around Kerbin, possibly doing something uh, secretive and something elusive. And um, no one except for the Department of Defense really knows what exactly it's doing. But there's there has been quite a, uh, quite a few missions already. As a matter of fact, um, OTV-1 uh, has already landed back on, um, on Earth back in... November of 2010, and this was actually the first autonomous landing by NASA and the f uh, second autonomous landing in the world after the Soviet Buran was also able to land autonomously, meaning that there was no pilot, it was just kind of gliding back to the surface by itself and landing um, at an airfield completely by itself using the gear that you see somewhere right here. There's the gear. I'm releasing it right now. Basically, we'll be try. We'll try to use this uh, on the way back to Kerbin, and we'll try to do the same autonomous landing um, if we can. Although it's actually kind of hard. I've tried this before. It is not very easy, especially because this is not a very stable craft, and it has really, really tiny wings that don't provide enough lift. And the other two missions, OTV-2 and OTV-3, have already um, finished their um, projects as well, but we st obviously don't know what they were about. There's a lot of speculations about them possibly testing new space technologies, possibly testing new satellites, and uh, of course, possibly testing new spy satellites. But uh, once again, it wasn't really announced. But nevertheless, there's actually quite a lot of information that's already known about this particular space plane and a lot of really interesting, cool things. So first of all, I think most people don't realize that this is uh, essentially the second generation of space shuttle. So the original space shuttle has been scrapped, but what NASA decided to create is this tiny miniature uh, version of it that was then take, taken over by the Air Force. And this particular um, space shuttle is essentially autonomous, but does exactly or almost exactly the same missions that the original space shuttle could do, except much cheaper and much better. So anything to do with satellites or anything to do with repairs, anything to do with um, essentially changing direction, changing orbit in um, low Earth orbit is very, very well done by the satellite because it has quite a lot of delta V. I think, um, I believe the actual numbers are like 3,000 meters per second uh, of delta V, which is really, really high. 
in a low Earth orbit, meaning that it can do quite a lot of various maneuvering. It's also very, very small. It's only about 8.8 um, .8 meters long, at least the first incarnation of this model. And uh, the future models might be a little bit bigger, but for now, it's actually very, very, very small. So as a matter of fact, it's about the size of a small bus. Uh, so it's something that you can possibly even fit in your garage. But I guess the most interesting thing about this particular craft is that it has incredibly long missions. All of its missions um, have been ridiculously long. I think the longest one is actually 674 days. That's basically two years, two years in space doing something really secretive that nobody knows about. And we still don't, and it's really, really fascinating. It's definitely something that a lot of people have been asking questions about. But yeah, so there, there's a lot of secrecy behind this project. Now we're going to actually uh, return it back to Kerbin now. We're going to try to estimate where we have to land here. And I don't really know. Okay, so we're gonna try to land right there. This is where Kerbal Space Center is, which means that we need to maybe, so rule of thumb is that you go 90 degrees. We need to try to decelerate here. Add maneuver node, decelerate, and decelerate until you hit the ground. There we go. So we're going to launch ourselves right around here. This is in four minutes. Uh, we're going to position ourselves at retrograde location and launch ourselves. Decrease speed by 267 meters. And this should technically um, return us back to Kerbin, but at the same time, possibly uh, return us somewhere close to Kerbal Space Center where we're going to try to land. It might not work, but it might actually work as well. So let's see if this works. Uh, four minutes. Let's actually warp to the next node, and right around here, we're going to begin burning our last engine. Now, this engine is actually a little bit less stable because it's uh, on the side here, so it, it does create a lot of instability when we try to burn. As you can see, my, my ship starts wobbling a lot. Uh, but in reality, this engine is actually really good at uh, positioning itself just so that it actually aims at the center of mass. Not so much in, in this game though, so we have to do a lot of this. We have to do a lot of twisting and turning. Uh, now the cool thing is that you can actually also see this uh, craft from the ground. As a matter of fact, many amateur astronomers often take pictures of this craft as it orbits around Earth. There's several websites that allow you to see where it's positioned currently, and you can even try to detect it yourself. It's not as big as International Space Station, but you can still see it with relatively powerful binoculars orbiting around our planet. Um, so currently it's been in space for about 500 days, and you can definitely see it if you look close enough. All right, so we're almost there. Maybe not so much. Let's see if this has actually decreased our speed enough. Uh, maybe a little bit more. Let's do retrograde positioning and decrease speed a little bit more. And that's enough. Okay, so now we're going to be returning to Kerbin. And this will be our return stage. Autonomous return stage where we're basically going to be um, essentially landing back autonomously on the ground, and I say on the ground because I'm possibly or probably or very likely I'm going to miss the actual uh, landing pad. But we're going to position ourselves the way that this would position itself in real life, just like the space shuttle. So there you go. And let's, uh, might as well start closing these soon, but we're going to wait uh, until we get a little bit closer to, to the ground until we close um, this hatch right here. Now, the other thing about this particular project is that it's actually so successful that there has been quite a lot of um, variants planned, and most of them are a little bit larger than this. So the first variant might actually be used for cargo delivery, specifically delivery of cargo to International Space Station, uh, thus replacing uh, the SpaceX missions or possibly replacing the Russian missions as well, making this a little bit cheaper to maintain. And the other uh, model that's going to be even larger than this, about 155%, so it's about this big, um, the, this particular project would actually be uh, even delivering astronauts, possibly up to six people to International Space Station, or might even be used as a kind of an emergency ambulance, uh, bringing back astronauts from International Space Station or from other stations back to Earth. Now, all of this is still in planning, but because this is so successful and because it's so resilient and so good at landing autonomously, it's definitely something that NASA is currently planning. Uh, all right, so we're going to stabilize this, and we're now approaching Kerbin. We're going to actually possibly increase the speed here a little bit. We're going to approach Kerbin and try to land like a professional Kerbinat that we are, but we're possibly, very, very possibly, are, are going to not succeed or end land in the water. 
the actual craft is difficult to control manually, but had I created some kind of a program to run this automatically, it would be very, very successful at landing itself because it's actually a really easy to control when it's close to the, to the ground and it's really, really easy to land um, as well. But you'll see that it's actually a very successful design even when re-entering. So let's just check the map really quickly. Are we going to undershoot this? Yeah, we're going to undershoot this for sure. So we need to be right there, but we're not going to make it that far. Well, it looks like we're going to be landing either in the water or possibly somewhere where it should be landing. Unless, of course, I do this. Unless I uh, take my craft and position it a little bit more prograde so that it's actually burning a little bit more um, efficiently. And we're going to close these as well, just so that we don't actually destroy our craft. And so that's not exactly what I was planning to do, but it looks like we're already wobbling too much. Let's just get to prograde. And here we go. Here comes the burn. We're going to try to re-enter atmosphere without killing ourselves. Or I guess there's nothing to kill because it's autonomous, but without destroying the craft. And this will hopefully be enough for us to slow down so that we can land somewhere on, on this mass um, land mass right to, the, to our left. I, I think we're going to be okay. I think we're actually not going to be uh, dying anytime soon. But you never know. I've said that before and I've destroyed craft before as well. Uh, but um, the most exciting part of this mission is of course the um, astronaut delivery mission, which I think might be actually planned for sometime in 2020, that might actually create... A explosions! Yeah, I think I just destroyed something. Create a craft that will be able to essentially um, easily deliver uh, astronauts without really any time delay. And uh, it will be a lot more efficient than the space shuttle because it would be completely autonomous. So no pilot error um, would actually influence the, the mission. What did I lose? Oh, I lost my nose, my nose cap. That's okay. We, didn't, we don't need no nose caps. Let's open our um, gear and aim for the land. This is a, a very, very stable design, actually. It's, it's really, really, really good at essentially um, re-entering from space and basically delivering things back to back to Earth, back to our Kerbin relatively safely. Now, the only reason I lost the nose cone is because I didn't slow down enough in the beginning. I should have slowed down a little bit more using my uh, my bottom right here. This is where you would, you would have the regular heat shields, and um, using these heat shields, this particular design would usually slow down just enough before re-entering Earth. But I didn't do that, I just kind of played by the eye, played by the ear, and lost my nose cone, which now makes landing a little bit more tricky, but we still are going to be able to kind of possibly pull it off. All right, so let's uh, let's do this, let's do, like, let's do this like a professional autonomous vehicle that we are and try to land in this mountainous region of Kerbin. And so this is the gliding stage, the last stage right before the landing. Normally this would be happening above some sort of an uh, airfield or I guess some kind of an airport where this vehicle can land. And normally this would be a military installation. Uh, so we, we can pretend that this is a military installation somewhere out there that we're going to land to. Oh no, this is not good. This is not good. It's uh, surprisingly difficult to control right now, but it gets a little bit easier when you get closer to the, to the ground. Uh, but for now, we're just going to try to aim ourselves at any ground, really. Just ground in general, just so we can actually gently touch down as soon as we get closer to it. And it looks like I'm actually aiming at the water, which is not exactly what I wanted. Let's maybe go up a little bit more. Or better even, let's turn to the left and let's gently touch down on this massive piece of land right here. Let's see if this works. Like a pro, like a professional autonomous vehicle that we are. So as I mentioned before, this is actually the second uh, craft that is able to autonomously land on Earth, but it's also the smallest spacecraft, or uh, sorry, uh, the smallest space plane in the world. It actually holds the Guinness World Record for being the tiniest, tiniest space shuttle orbiter ever. And um, it also has an achievement for um, significantly advancing the state of art for re reusable craft, um, and uh, any kind of on-orbit operations. So it won this award back in 2015. And um, 
In total, this craft has already spent something like 1400 days in space, which is a ridiculously high amount. It's a very, very long time if you think about it. And uh, it's kind of funny that this is not a very well-known craft. It's so secretive, as a matter of fact, that most people have possibly never even heard of it. Most people don't realize that the space shuttle that was so popular before is not really that. It just reincarnated itself as a tiny, tiny version of this uh, autonomous craft that you see in front of you, known as X-37B. Uh, now, the B designation is because this is the second version, uh, but there's going to be other designations, uh, possibly C, D, E, and so on, uh, depending on the missions that this craft will perform. Right now, it's still very secretive and very, very uh, mechanical in nature. Basically, it possibly delivers satellites or fixes satellites or captures satellites. Uh, we don't really know what's happening up there. Uh, but... Um, the future missions that will involve human beings will possibly not be so secretive anymore and will involve a little bit more openness from the um, Department of Defense and, of course, the Air Force as well. All right, so here comes the moment of truth. Can we do it? Can we do it? And can we, Or can we possibly crash and die and destroy our beautiful robot? So there we go. Boom. Lost a wing. Who cares? Don't need a wing. We're done. Let's slow down, use the brakes. And perfect landing. Look at that even had a little skid mark on, at the end. And there you go. So that's essentially the mission in a nutshell. This is the craft known as X-37B, without the wing, but still working. And just to show you the hatch again, this is what it looks like on the inside. So there is the craft made completely from uh, the parts stock parts, that is, in Kerbal Space Program. And anyway, I hope you learned something from this particular video, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. And let me know if you have any other ideas or any other uh, things you would like to see uh, using Kerbal Space Program, because I do want to start playing this game again. I love it quite a lot, actually. Uh, it used to be one of, one of my favorite games ever, um, and I would like to actually return to it now that it's actually version 1.2. Thank you for watching, guys. Please subscribe if you still haven't. Share this video with someone who enjoys watching space videos. And also possi possibly consider supporting us on Patreon as well, just to help me be buy better equipment for the future. I'll see you in the next video, give me later, and as always, bye-bye. Now I wonder if I can actually take off, because I still have some fuel left. Maybe, just maybe, I can possibly take off, and look at that, we're flying again, ha! Huh? Take that, science. Oh, no, 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 oh! Well, that happened too, apparently. Mission success!